formally was more formally um, initiated more uh, recently, to some extent based on our, our learning. So I'm going to talk about promoting international collaboration. And uh, you can see, everyone can see this right here at the top. Good. So uh, what's the need for international collaboration? And uh, then I'll talk about the IWIN, which is in fact a very successful network that's been around for as long as CIMIT has. And I'll talk about the International Wheat Yield Partnership, which was our first priority. I guess we started thinking about that a little over 10 years ago. And it, it, it started formally in 2014. The Weed Initiative, in a way, came from came out of discussions we were having when we were talking about the hybrid. And uh, the Heat and Drought and Heat and Drought Weed Improvement Consortium Hedwig, which is uh, one of the which came out of one of the expert working groups, or really was the first expert working group of the Weed Initiative, and um, some of the lessons we've learned along the way. And then we'll have time for discussion at the end. So I think let's start here. I'm pretty sure everyone is familiar with this global yield projection now that is uh, showing that for all of the state reports, uh, the current rates of genetic gains is simply not high enough to match what is the predicted demand uh, by 2050. And now that situation hasn't changed. Um, this is one of the key reasons why we need to network, because a lot of the research that is required to match the demands is coming from public uh, funding, which is declining. Um, and so to make, to make that funding more efficient, we network essentially to avoid redundancy, to capitalize on each other's ideas and so on. Of course, the private sector also- Ma Matthew, just one question. Uh, can you enlarge the, can you go into presentation mode? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Thank That's you. better, isn't it? Yeah. The private sector also investing, but by definition, they, uh, they're not investing they, they're, they're working more as silo because they have to maintain a competitive edge. So actually one of our more recent initiatives is to try and <clears throat> define pre-competitive research and set up a public-private partnership. But maybe that'll be a talk for another day. So these are some of the factors that we're having to deal with, apart from an increase in demand from a growing population and from industry, for many of those crops, uh, they lend themselves to food pressing, processing wheat, so I've been very good examples, maize to a lesser extent, no, maize to a great extent as well. Um, we also have a problem with the environment, uh, a less predictable climate, everyone can see that now, it's no longer a matter of speculation. Sorry, that's my phone. Throw that away. Depleting water resources is another problem. In, in, in all continents, there are regions where we have become dependent upon fossil water. In the in South Asia, for example, a lot of water is coming from ice melt glaciers. And Obviously, as the climate gets warmer, those resources are going to become less reliable. So things like that, just the physical environment is already worrying. And that's not to mention the fact that under changing climate, we see more diseases emerging, pests. Last year, we heard a lot about locusts. My colleagues in pathology are very concerned about the number of new disease races are popping up. And, and we all know as biologists that uh, if you change the environment, you create selection pressure. And disease, new disease uh, appetites will pop up very quickly. 
So that's another issue, the cost of energy and fertilizer, uh, the declining capacity for agricultural research in many, not just many less developed countries, uh, many, any country. The, uh, the, um, my, own, my own country announced severe cutbacks on um, overseas development assistance quite recently that affects a lot of my colleagues in the projects. And then of course, soil degradation is another issue. Here's some shocking statistics. 30, I, these kinds of statistics came as a surprise to me when I first saw them with their magnitude. 30% of the world arable land lost to erosion or pollution in the last 40 years. That's a shocking statistic. Um, and when you use plows, which I guess my farming is still using plows, the erosion rates are 10, anything from 10 to 100 times greater than, than just with, with rain, rain, of course, with rainfall. And of course, I think we all know that just to develop an, an inch of topsoil can take half a millennium. So these are very serious issues. And so the, these are among the many reasons why it's important for us as agricultural scientists to try to work together. And that's the key really here about networking. How can we, how can we develop networks and how can we do it more effectively and how can we convince funders to respect that? Um, many, many times funding is, is dedicated to a, um, to a national program, which does not help with an international effort. And since most of the agricultural problems don't respect national boundaries, pathogens don't, uh, you get heat stress and drought stress and issues of improving productivity in any continent, in any, in, in, in any, in any continent, you can see all these stresses. So in some ways, the way we fund research um, impedes our ability to collaborate. It's, it's not, a, it's not, we can overcome that. And in the case of the I with the International Real Partnership, we did, we had really struggled a bit more, but uh, we need to be thinking of agriculture in a global context. Uh, if we're to a, a, a approach those problems in a more efficient way. And here's some other statistics just to show you that, uh, that uh, although we've made inroads, the situation internationally, especially in terms of poverty, is not as great as, as we would like it to be, or as sometimes we say it is. For example, there are more, if you look at uh, percentages, um, things look good, but if you look at it, absolute numbers, they're not as great as, as we would like them to be. Okay, these data are a few years old now, I think four years old, but still things haven't changed that much in the last uh, three or four years. Uh, today, there are more hungry people than the entire population of South Asia at the beginning of the Green Revolution. Number of people living on less than $2 a day is the same as in 1981. That's uh, almost a billion people. And if we look at uh, malnourishment of children in Africa, say, there's still a very, very serious problem with 180 million people, at least children under five years in the malnourished. So these are the, some of the kinds of problems. Networking is, networking can be fun, but that's not why we do it here. Networking is, is really about stretching more impact from limited resources. That's the name of the, the bottom line, as well as being able to, um, to share good ideas to solve very uh, serious problems for our society. Um, the, if there's any doubt about the importance of investment in agriculture per se, this study from 2007 showed how investments in, in agriculture compared with non-agricultural investments have a disproportionately beneficial effect on the poorest of, 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 of people, the poorest 10% of, of uh, people in the world pretty much are benefited most by investment in agriculture and hardly at all by other growth in the non-agricultural sector 
And that's still true when you're looking at uh, even up to 30% poorest people in the, on the planet. It's agriculture that gets people out of poverty, in other words, or has the potential to do so. So let's move from those generalities to wheat, say. So wheat is a, it's this, this map shows you the ranking calories coming from wheat across the world. And most of the world is red in this picture, which shows that wheat is the number one source of calories, but there are many important countries where it's number two, uh, particularly South and East Asia, Mexico. And you can see from this graph, the, uh, it's clear that uh, it's no surprise that 20% of all calories in the human diet are coming from wheat. The one fifth of all calories um, when you consider that our networking experience can easily be extrapolated to other crops like maize, rice, and so on, you're talking about 50 or more percent of all calories coming to from just a handful of staple foods. I think if you put in soybean, it's something like 60 percent, which is also interesting in the fact that 20% um, of all human protein also, if you put a protein map up like instead of, I have one, I just didn't talk about Similar picture, 20% of all protein is coming from, from wheat too. Um, so it's clearly a crop worth investing in, worth trying to put the networks together. So the first network, um, I guess, perhaps the first network in agriculture in modern times, certainly internationally, yeah, it was the International Weed Improvement Network that CIMIT has coordinated since the 60s. Although it's worth mentioning that its birth actually came from the USDA in the 19, early 1950s, who were interested in, in monitoring uh, leaf rust around the world. Because as we all know, a disease like rust, it's been seen with stem rust, the stem rust, the leaf rust, yellow rust can be utterly devastating to, to the crop. And if they spread as they can very easily, uh, you can have a, a, very, a very major impact on global productivity. So kudos to uh, the USDA back in the 50s for initiating this kind of network. So they could see essentially where rust, uh, which direction it was spreading and take appropriate action. And this effort was taken over by Orlov and CIMIT since the 60s and continues to this day. It's sadly and oddly hard to fund. You'd think it would be one of the highest priorities for CGIO, <clears throat> but not so. And one could speculate of why, what are the reasons, because of course, if you, if you don't have rust resistant varieties, you're put into the position of spraying with fungicides which uh, Western countries can afford to do and do, do but uh, if you're a less developed country farmer, that's a, a different proposition altogether. So at least for the time being, CIMIT is still prioritizing disease resistance through this network, the International Improvement Network. And you can see the, all of the dots, uh, the testing sites. That's not to say they're all, they're all uh, testing nurseries every single year, but historically, these, the site was about 700, and many of them are private sector. Um, some of them are small seed companies, for example, in India, in Sub Saharan Africa, Southern Plum. I mean, all you can see the blue dots in Australia, <clears throat> but mostly they're, they're wheat, national wheat programs. So, probably the eye win encompasses pretty much everyone in the world who's got a serious commercial interest. In wheat, so it's a very, it's a very important network, and it's worth mentioning that uh, there's a lot of goodwill associated with the um, In the sense that, while CGR is distributing, so Simid and Ikad are distributing nursery. Uh, at least half of the, well, around half of the collaborators are providing data back. So that's a massive in-kind contribution this uh, international public good reading effort. 
the fact that all of our members, or most of our members in the network are giving something back one way or another. And we're actually now looking at ways to make that easier. Some, some, some programs don't return data, probably they're very resource strapped. And we're now looking, uh, we've got a proposal to use, to see how much data we can collect from satellites. So obviously we do that in agreement with those programs, but it may be a way to augment the amount of data that we get back, certainly the quality of that data we use satellite imagery um, to look at establishment and, and so on and so forth. Plus, it's now more feasible to recreate uh, net data. And we have a big effort under Hedwig, which I'll come to later, which is to try and understand better the genotype by environment interaction, the genetic basis, the physiological basis of that. This all helps to improve the overarching goal of the IWA network, which is to breed, refine the breeding effort <clears throat> so we can distribute better germplasm to all collaborators. So really, uh, the IWIN is the inspiration for other networks like Edward and IWIN. No question there, and it's still continuing and, and successful. Um, to give an idea of that success, uh, analyses that were made that are listed there, Lipton, Longhurst, uh, Evanson, Gollin, and Elliot, Alan Schoen, that germplasm has increased productivity for more than 100 million farmers just in the last development of the world. And we also know that the island, the disease resistance has been very important, for example, for the US breeders and uh, in Europe as well. Some of those disease genes have been able to be picked up and used. So the actual um, impact is far greater than just in LDCs. Um, Stevens, Stevenson, sorry, Adele, um, showed that the Green Revolution had probably saved at least 20 million hectares of land for the population due to the increase in yield. So that's an important environmental impact, apart from what I mentioned earlier that uh, if you grow a symmetry line, you almost certainly don't need to apply fungus, unless you poured out in a, one of those years where a new race pops up out of the blue. And I win related writers cover about half of the weed area in less developed countries. I'll show some statistics on that. And it's calculated by economists that the that annual value of improved germplasm in terms of just yield, that's not actually counting the value of the rust resistance or the other, and the other diseases, is worth between two and three billion dollars a year, which is a good return on investment. If you consider the amount of money that's invested in wheat breeding, it's around 100 to one. Um, as I say, without considering the impact of avoiding disease pandemics. And then again, I win has amassed a lot of data over the years, which under Hedwig we're trying to make better use of more than 10 million data points. Some of it is not in great shape, needs curation. And that's what we're investing in. And this figure shows you it's a breakdown. It's from the Atlantic Canada study, and it covers a period from uh, 1990. To 2014, and show basically what it shows is if we look at the right hand column and the percentage of release, we see that about 25% of the global level of all wheat released is actually directly coming from similar oil cattle. That's a huge impact. If you look at lines that have at least one CDR parent, in the crops of the line that's released, it goes up to 50%. If you consider ancestry, it's 75%. So only about 20, just over 25% of wheat grown in the world has not been touched by this network. That's an impressive impact when you consider that's 20% of global calorie. If you look at a <clears throat> region like South Asia, which is our, one of our prime targets, it's even more, influential half of the lines grown uh, directly from CGR and three quarters of have a parent <clears throat> and only about 15% are not related to CGR. And of course, there's a lot of rhetoric around this 
some some are some funders argue that that too big an impact and it's, it's creating dependence and then there's the issue of whether or not that competes with private interests it's complicated and not the subject of this seminar but you know when you look at these kinds of statistics it's worth keeping in mind that um, they're not uncontested by all stakeholders so let's move on to our work. I think we first at CIMIT, I think it was when the, one of the new iterations of, of CGIR started, I think it was around 2009 or 2008 that we first started talking about a project to increase, increase the absolute yield potential of wheat. So in other words, push wheat up to its biological limits. And if you make a project as ambitious as that, my former boss, Hans Brown, used to say, well, going to the moon was easier than raising the uh, crop to uh, its biological limits. And you think about the, the kind of science involved, it's, uh, it's not as straightforward as, as Newtonian mechanics, that is true. Um, and there are many gray areas, there are many black boxes. Well, we actually are guessing, but there is also information that we can use. And so the point of the IWEB and its predecessor, the Wheat Yield Consortium, um, was really to pull together expertise globally. Who are the people who are really thinking about how to improve wheat yield potential? And of course, when you do that, you realize that, as you would expect, we all have our academic training, so we don't look at the whole picture. That's the job of a network is to bring the whole picture together. We, we're looking at experts, we found experts, but we knew experts in photosynthesis, in partitioning, in root biology, etc., genetics. And so the point of Ivory, and very much a model that we use for Edward too, is to bring in the interests bring together the interests of different groups and see how we can work together, see how we can raise funds together and see how we, our ideas or our approaches for raising genetic yield potential are actually complementary. Um, and because if you can do things together at the same time, you're more likely to have an impact in, in the short to medium term and if you're all working individually. Let me give you an example. Let's say we raise the potential, this is hypothetical, but if we raise the potential of wheat 50%, as was our goal, you're going to have these plants with a very heavy spike. And of course, one of the biggest uh, limitations would then be structural failure or logic. And the plant would collapse. And then you're back to the drawing board. So we have we pushed that, uh, let's look at, or oh, another example, you raise the radiation insufficiency 50% and you have all this extra biomass, but not all of it's going to the grain. So we can't just look at photosynthesis and, and ignore lodging and the poor partition, et cetera. Or you may have a, a uh, photosynthetic potential in the leaves, but it's not matched by a vascular system that delivers water and nutrients. There are many angles where, although it's, it's part of science to be reductionist and to focus on the problem, to push that with the uh, knowledge frontier forward, if it, when it comes to application, and wheat breeding is application, and uh, making sure that, that those genetic gains are achieved in farmers' fields, you need many disciplines working together to make sure that all of your research strands uh, to, to as far as, as far as one as possible are harmonious. So I started with these ideas, same, same as the, one of the first graphs, that there's a big problem out there, big challenge. That's how we solve, solve the idea that there's a crisis on the horizon. You know, for example, BBRCC from my own government were concerned um, to see countries uh, in, in and around uh, North Africa and the Middle East become more self-sufficient in wheat. Because of course there is a, an issue with migration and that issue is not going away. And 
whatever your view is on the issue of migration and taking people, I think we can all agree that it's ideal that the countries where people are fleeing from would have food self-sufficiency if it's all possible. And at least that way we could choose. If, uh, or at least that's not a factor in, in migration. So, um, as I say, the stated goal was to raise GDP by 2035. That date is looks a bit scarily close compared with when we first started talking about these ideas. But we have made some gains, not 50%, but some quite promising gains we're seeing up to almost 10. And let's see with the research coming down the pipe, pipeline, what we can achieve by 2035. I would be very happy to 50%. That's that. It's one needs an ambitious goal when, when setting up these kinds of initiatives. There's no question. And 100% uh, would be ridiculous and probably defy biophysical principles. 50%. Let's see. Um, I think we uh, can be forgiven if we don't make it, but hopefully if we get halfway there, that will be grounds for considering <clears throat> maintaining this kind of network alive. Um, and I, I covered most of these points, combining best ideas in that, uh, internationally, uh, making breakthroughs, but focusing on delivery, focusing on demand. These are all core principles of a network. Uh, a productivity oriented network. And you can see this graph, this uh, figure rather shows nicely some of the ideas going for improving your potential. It's not just about energy use efficiency, that's another way of saying respiration, photosynthesis, the biomass. It's also harvest index, grain size, spike fertility. You've got to consider the phenology, not just from a point of view of your potential, but a point of view of control, experimental control, canopy architecture. And then we're always looking for better uh, phenotyping protocols, but also markers uh, that we can use, genetic markers that we can use so that uh, some of the more, especially for the more difficult to phenotype for, very important, not easy because as as all of us know, the complex traits, genetically complex traits, markers are slippery as hell. Uh, so we need a greater and greater knowledge base in order to make use of the market to know in which environments, <coughs> excuse me, and which genetic backgrounds of markers will be useful and which combinations of markers. And of course, one of the goals of IWIP is it's not just focusing on a single trait, as you can see from this diagram, there are many traits to juggle. And if each of these has many QTLs associated with, that's a lot of markers and how do they interact? Could there be antagonism? This is one of the benefits of looking at the genetic basis. You can actually find those kinds of um, hypotheses. You can get information on those kinds of hypotheses about traits that interact or have trade-offs or are even antagonistic. You can use markers to show that, but you also hope that the markers can help you actually make selections. So that's the key, the key element of, of uh, this network. You also, <clears throat> when you have a network, you kind of need a tip of the spear. You need a body or a hub that brings things together. Not just from the point of view of coordination, but also bringing the technology together in terms of delivery. So for Spring Week, we've, we've been working at the hub for five, more than five years now, delivering nurseries and bringing people who are involved in the wider network to work on relevant germplasm or taking their germplasm and planting it and validating it or taking their selection methodologies. And very often both. Um, people developing methodologies, bringing them to the hub. So we have a common reference point, which are these kinds of panels that we know are relevant because they are based on the most current germplasm coming from the breeders. 
So these are all the kinds of activities we're conducting at the farm to take validation, decision phenotyping, field evaluation. The, the strategic crossing designed to stack physiological traits um, in order to boost your potential. So a lot of it is um, based on hyper hypothesis and de 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 finding sources, novel sources of these traits and combining them with two, sometimes three way crossing. And some of those crosses work and some don't. So we try to understand what is the physiological and genetic basis when we do see transgressive segregation in which traits are contributing more. And of course, as I said earlier, it's not straightforward. We are, though with the work in, in breeding, know that um, one can have a lot of interactions uh, that make that, that work slow, let's say. But uh, again, that's exactly why you need a network. You need many, many heads thinking about these problems. Because if it was straightforward, we solved it all some time ago, probably. This is the more restricted uh, network of sites that are growing the, the wicked trial. Um, obviously, when distributing more you find germ present, there's a greater demand, uh, or at least initially. And when you're distributing pre-reading material, which may be a bit taller, a bit less amenable to certainly less amenable to risk. But having said that, the demand for all these nurseries are, is now almost the same as the demand for the Finnish breeding nurseries, which is very encouraging. because It means we've met one of our object objectives, which is to encourage uh, the breeding companies and the national wheat breeding programs to actually be um, making more crosses involving this kind of material that we're developing, which is genetically diverse. We're using a lot of land races that have shown promising physiological traits. We're using synthetics. These are new genomes derived from interspecific hybridization for specific traits like radiation insufficiency, et cetera. So we're putting those traits into good backgrounds. People are picking up and crossing with them, which is very good news. Um, this is just an overview. I don't think we need to dwell on this. It gives you an idea of the kind of budget you need, I suppose, for a big project. Um, the target was 100 million, and it shows you this graph is it's kind of showing you uh, it's a, that figure would be higher now. It's uh, four years ago, three years ago. But uh, more or less how the money was coming from and where, where it was. So we had a first call, a second call. We had a call involving USDA called NIFA. And the hub takes some money and the program coordination. So, yeah, you can get into some. It's a bit complicated with the finances. Not my expertise. You can ask someone else to talk about that. But certainly an important consideration when you are a big a big uh, network, you've got to have good governance. That's essential. Um, and uh, that governance helps you to maintain the interest from funders because they feel more confident when they, uh, when they see that uh, there is um, rigor in the way that uh, the, whole, the whole network is administered. These are some of the entities associated with funding on the public side, and, but also some contributions from the private sector, which made this a, 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 an interesting initiative. Weed initiative in some ways was born out of this exercise we had um, of developing the Wheat Yield Consortium or International Wheat Yield Partnership. Some of the people involved realized that this exercise was not just good for your potential, but good for a whole lot of other things. And so the weed initiative was born. Um, abiotic stresses, as well as your potential, so Edward, control of pathogens, durum as a focus, um, germplasm conservation, quality, nitrogen use efficiency, agronomy, breeding methods, weed inf information systems, Wheat phenotyping to support weed improvements with a phenotyping expert working with, and of course, modeling. 
So although these are not, um, we couldn't argue that the Weed Initiative is funding these expert working groups to conduct research, it is funding them to, to, to have certain, let's say to have a community of practice. And that is a starting point for developing a more active um, research network for any of those areas. And some of those networks have brought in their own funding. I think the agronomy is a good example. And uh, maybe others, you can, perhaps the audience can correct me on that. Let's go now lastly to Hedwig then. So this was prioritized by the Weed Initiative uh, five years ago. And uh, it wasn't easy at first to get support for this. And luckily a couple of years ago, and I don't know why. I mean, this, this, this seminar is really intended to help people uh, or share our experience of putting together um, major initiatives. And of course, funding is always the hardest step and uh, it can take a long time. And it's unpredictable. You would think that uh, in a changing climate, getting together funding for weed and drought tolerance would be relatively straightforward, but it isn't. It isn't. And one of the reasons I think is that, I think through the experience of IWIC in particular, it became aware, it became obvious that it was not very, it was not nearly as easy as individuals have thought due to national constitutions and so on to actually share funding in a common pot. So um, there was some resistance, let's say, or difficulty in finding money. And in the end, Hedwig's rebirth, you could say, came when we were able to make a partnership with the FFR, so a single organization that was interested in funding initiatives um, that already had support, so which Hedwig did, came forward and uh, are now funding at least a hub, the equivalent of the IWIC hub, but for weed and drought. And of course, what we need now is more funding for the research, but I'll come to that in a second. The background, I mean, all of us, none of us need a, a I'm preaching to the choir if I wax lyrical too much about the threat of uh, increasing temperatures, we know that. This is a nice graph. This is productivity of wheat in the Yaqui Valley, Northwest Mexico, where, where um, Obregon, so where Simit's, uh, where you could say the wheat green revolution really started in this valley of farmers. These are farm yields against uh, nighttime temperature. What you see is the warmer the night temperature, the lower the yield. And it's a pretty, it's a pretty strong association, even if you can make a breakthrough in terms of yield per se, like with this uh, with Durham weed in the red line, CMO, it's still subject to the effect of night temperature. And that correlation with night temperature, we, we see it in rice, we've seen it in other crops. And um, that's one of the challenges of public, to try to understand that because we don't, we, if you made that correlation for day temperature, or max temperature, you wouldn't see it. It seems for some reason night temperature is dominating you. And yet how much do we know about it? How much do we know about that? the physiology or the genetics of night temperature, of adapting to night temperature, very, very little, which kind of um, suggests that uh, investment is not always symmetrical in the way that we need it. And that's another, as I said, another initiative we're trying to begin it to start now as a public-private partnership to try and understand better the physiology so that we can make use of knowledge in a more symmetrical way. But anyway, that's just an example, an example of the kind of legwork that needs to be put in. So for Hedwig to set up an initiative, we had a broad consultation back in 2014, uh, involving 370 people, 77 institutes in 32 countries. We asked people, we brought 100 of those people together in Frankfurt, and we wanted to discuss a few issues like what is the most relevant research for heat and drought. Um, how can we arrange that in a framework? What's the structure that we need to facilitate translation of research? We also need a bioinformatics cyber infrastructure. So 
structure. And as a uh, value to that, we asked people how important the stresses were. People in our expert working group, and Peter Gutt came up right on top, as you would expect, but also other stresses then. They're very often there in your heat and drought stressed environments, salinities, frost, flooding, soil problems. All of these can pop up on top of heat and drought. Anyway, so this is the latest version of uh, Hedwig. It's not quite what we imagined at the beginning, but still it is a uh, translational and reading hub. And it has these nine goals. This, I think, Isabel is my last slide, but we're still yeah, more or less. So let me just quickly go through, I think if we say what are the gaps and we're trying to address them and you can read the rest of the one, but Certainly insufficient detail of breeding targets. And as I mentioned, the IWIN database of 10 million or more data points is a great resource for us to uh, try to gain a better understanding of breeding targets. So a network can always be, should always benefit from what's gone before. These are key selling points for a network that you have capital in terms of data or expertise, et cetera, et cetera. So filling goal number one is really helped by that high, the other network behind it, because of all that data it's produced. Limited genetic diversity for climate resilience. So of course, here we're looking at exploring vast untapped reserves of genetic resources. And um, there are precedents in terms of disease resistance. But of course, looking for the more complex physiological traits for heat and drought times for your potential, not as easy as identifying a disease resistant line, and not, nor is it as easy to use in breeding, but it's doable. And so we're working on those. More comprehensive phenomic tools that relates directly to the previous goal, in the sense that uh, genetic resources often are and less controlled plant types. So you need to be innovative when it comes to phenotype. Um, limited understanding of genetic basis. We all, we're all aware of the, of the optimism at the beginning of the gene revolution. Some of it has been realized for less, or for simply inherited traits, but for complex traits, we're still struggling. So we need better understanding. Goal five, um, strategies to stack traits. It's related to the phenotyping and it's also related to the genotyping. Uh, goal six, insufficient genetic gains. That's very much a breeding oriented goal and that one is uh, mostly funded by the Accelerating Genetic Gains Project. It's funded via UK and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And then goal seven is a scale out. So that's where I went, the network of I went comes back in. And uh, we rely on that massive income contribution from our huge network of weak readers. Um, and so one of, the, one, of the, one of the goals that we introduced into this project was, was crowdsourcing. So while IWIP has a big budget for funding research per se, uh, the way we set up Hedwig, again, restricted by the funding opportunity that was available, we decided to make some of the money for the hub available in a crowdsourcing concept, context to get ideas. So we actually uh, looking for inputs from former collaborators or new collaborators on how we can boost technologies to overcome the drought. And we would like that part to be expanded through the through the ahead initiative, which is. Now the umbrella organization on the weed initiative to, to, consider a, uh, to consider the issue of weed and drought um, in, a, in a broader context than just spring wheat. And goal nine is basically about capacity building. So all of these goals can feed into that. And these, this is the current network for the group, so representing a lot of countries. And as I said, this is the AHEAD initiative, which uh, considers Hedwig part of, part of the overall effort to, um, global effort to coordinate each drought research. Um, so just summing up, 
I went a bit over time, sorry, it's about, but still 10 minutes for questions. So just some of the lessons learned. Um, to set up a network, you need a clear, and really you need a new focus. Because um, otherwise the question is why are you setting up another network to do the same thing? You, it's, it really helps to have a pre-existing informal network. And, and as one advances in, in your career, uh, we, we develop networks of people, people we've met, people we've worked with, people we, we, uh, we want to work with, and so on. So the informal network is a very good starting point for a formal network. And of course, it's important to know the literature and what's going on. So we've even done surveys where you're bothering people, what are you doing on your projects? But still, mostly, I think it's nine. I think it's honest, true to say that in in the drop research space, uh, generally speaking, whether it's public or private, people are pretty open to sharing ideas. As far as at least uh, publicly, yes, private sector. As far as they are committed to, they will. It's still very collegial. And um, that's very key to establishing a network, goodwill, you could call it. It's good to develop a, pro a proposal before you have a funder in place, but don't overly prescribe because the funder likes to have a say in what's done. And that's fair enough. Um, as we say in English, he who pays the pipe and pulls the tune, and we must respect. That, uh, or it's important not to get too specific, otherwise you may get disappointed. You need a theory of change. That's uh, how is what you're planning to do going to change the, the uh, create outputs and, and create outcomes as well. You need a business case. And you need to do a lot of legwork. And that could be in lots of forms. You know, everything above requires legwork, leg work, but also convincing the right people, meeting the right, the right people, building bridges to the people who can, in funding organizations or organizations that can convince their governments. That all requires an immense amount of work. And I have to give a lot of credit. We have to give a lot of credit to people um, in BBSRC, for example, USAID, people at CIMIT, my boss, Hans Brown, People who helped us do that legwork. You've got to have, you've got to have your friends and colleagues in place, and expect grey hair because uh, it's uh, it's not quick. You have to have a lot of patience, and you have to be ready for some setbacks. I could give a whole seminar about setbacks, but I don't want to do that. I'd rather we focus on the way ahead. So with that, uh, let's. Have some questions if there are any. And thanks for your attention. Um, thank you so much, Matthew. Uh, I didn't realize there were so many initiatives around weed. So thank you for enlightening me, at least me. Uh, maybe our audience knows uh, already knew some of the initiatives that you have mentioned. Um, I'm going to stop rec the recording right now.